Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, welcome. My name is Daniel Hanzalek, and you are watching the 43rd talk of the scheduling seminar. Today, I'm very happy to introduce Professor Erwin Pesch. He is uh, his Faculty of Economics and Business Administration of the University in Siegen. But at the same time, he is Director of the Center for Advanced Studies in Management in Leipzig. He went through many different types of jobs. He studied mathematics and computer science in Darmstadt. And then he was employed as a software engineer and research assistant at Commerce Bank. He also worked as an assistant professor uh, in university in Maastricht in Netherlands. And then he got his uh, professor degree in Bonn University. Uh, he is interested in logistics, decision support, project management, personal planning, scheduling, and most of them related to some different industrial projects. Uh, uh, by the way, he is also jogging and trying to do something for his health, as uh, elderly men typically do, I know it as well. And today he will speak about conflict free crane scheduling in a seaport terminal. Erwin, it's great to have you here, so please go ahead. Thank you, Stenek, uh, Mike, and Buhua for inviting me, and thank you for this nice introduction. So it's my pleasure to give a presentation here, and as you mentioned, the title is Conflict-Free Crane Scheduling in a Seaport Terminal. I'm very grateful to uh, Jenny Nosak, uh, who prepared some of the slides that you will see today and who perhaps is also joining at the moment, I don't know. Uh, let me briefly give you an outline of um, my presentation. So first, I will talk about the problem settings, the automated container terminal, the seaport terminal. You can think of any seaport terminal. I mainly think about Hamburg because our experience that we made was in Hamburg. So I will say something about the terminal layout, the yard layout, the container flow, and um, uh, the uh, cranes that are available there. And then the talk is uh, divided in two parts. First, I will consider twin cranes. Twin cranes are cranes that are uh, operating in a, in a container block and that are operating on the same level. They cannot overtake each other. I will discuss some policies um, and results. And then we will move over to the situation of crossover uh, uh, cranes or dual grains, and we will uh, see a formulation of the crossover grain scheduling problem. And then I will present to you a branch and cut approach um, that is based on logic based bender stick composition, some computational results, and probably the time will uh, be over it, um, when I reach the computational results. So we will not go into detail there. So, what is the problem setting? Um, we have a seaport terminal and in this seaport terminal we have a waterside area where vessels are moored at the berths and k cranes are used to load and unload containers we have the land side area that handles the hinterland container transportation and trucks and trains and in between we have the storage yard these are usually container blocks and containers are temporarily stored by yard cranes and are exchanged between the water side and the land side areas. And we have the water side transfer area. This area here, this is operated by internal vehicles. For instance, you can think about straddle carriers, automated guided vehicles, trucks, and it performs a container transport between the water side and the storage yard. And then we have the land side transfer area. This is this area here, and containers are picked up or delivered by external or by internal vehicles. And uh, trucks are employed to deliver or receive containers to or from trains. But um, here in this picture, you can see everything again in a little bit more detail. So the waterside area is here where the vessel is, and the landside area is behind the trains. The vessels arrive, and the vessels arrive with. Um, 15,000, 18,000, 20,000 containers, if they are large. And the burst cranes or the K cranes are going to load and unload the vessels. And you see a lot of optimization problems that you have here in this picture here. And one optimization problem 
is um, how to load containers on the vessel because the vessel that is going from Shanghai to Hamburg is not only stopping in Hamburg, it will have a, a, a couple of stop or a couple of stops on its way to Hamburg and containers will be loaded and unloaded uh, at each place. And then the question arises, how should the containers be stacked in this vessel? You would not like to have uh, situations uh, where a container is deep down in the vessel and you have to reshuffle a couple of containers that are stacked on top of it. So you would like to uh, stack the containers in the way that they can be easily accessed at the next part when they are needed to be removed from the vessel at the next part. On the other hand, you cannot pick the containers one by one from the front line to the back line, or you cannot load them in that way because containers have different weight. Many of these containers are empty. And if you do that, it may happen that the vessel will tilt and you have no access or no easy access anymore to the containers. So you have difficult optimization problems here. Then you have a difficult optimization problem with the assignment of the K cranes. Which K crane would you like to assign to which vessel? How many K cranes are you going to assign? How do you share the workload? Then there is the area where the containers are loaded to automated guided vehicles, or sometimes you have a, a small area where you can stake a few containers here. So the problem is how to schedule the automated guided vehicles and how to uh, commute with the vehicles between the storage yard. And the storage yard consists of container blocks. And you can imagine of a container block as a block of roughly 1,000 containers. And there are many of these blocks. I don't know exactly how many are in Hamburg. I should know. I saw it a couple of times, but I don't know. Maybe 20, 30, something like that. So scheduling the automated guided vehicles is also not an easy task. And um, I can recommend our paper with my co-authors Dominic Kress and Sebastian Maiswinkel that was um, published in each other few years ago and where we considered exactly this area here. Then there is um, then there are the container blocks. And on in each container block there are cranes, at least one, usually two, uh, that are handling the transport of the containers from um, those who come from the water side and enter the container block from the water side and leave to the land side. And those who come from the land side enter the container block and leave to the water side. So you have um, normally uh, two cranes handling that. You can have twin cranes that are operating on the same level and are unable to overtake each other. In other situations, you have uh, dual grains or crossover grains where one of the grain is larger. They share um, a rail track. Um, the twin cranes share a rail track, but the um, um, Dual grains don't share a rail track so that the larger grain can go over the smaller grain, whatever the smaller grain is doing. So they have complete access from the very left to the very right. And the, the smaller grain can go under the larger grain, but as long as the larger grain is not working in a bay. Then you have um, the situation here that you have internal and, exter uh, internal and external trucks or vehicles, so the internal vehicles carry the containers that are received at this head end. They carry the containers to um, the storage area where the containers reside a little bit longer than in this block. A little bit longer can even be a couple of weeks. Empty containers are sometimes transported elsewhere, for instance, for inspection, and containers are uh, transported to uh, um, a railway station from where they can go to the hinterland, for instance, to Germany or Poland. And the um, external tracks pick up the containers from here and immediately carry them to the hinterland. So you have a container flow that is going from the vessel through uh, these blocks, container blocks, and uh, you must assume that not only one container block is assigned um, to a vessel, there are several container blocks, um, and it continues uh, up to the drains or to the trucks. And you have an opposite container flow, usually, that is coming from here, going through the blocks, and then to the vessel. And these um, container flows are there at the same time. The reason why you have this uh, blocks here uh, is in order to um, um, 
have the transportation distance and therefore the transportation times of containers um, from the vessel to a drop-off place or from of, uh, those containers that are going to be loaded on the vessel from a pickup place to the vessel, you want to have these time, travel times or travel distance short because the overall objective, which is dominating all other objectives, is a, is a vessel's turnaround time. It is most important that the vessel's dwell time is as short as possible. And if you keep uh, such a storage yard close to the vessel, you can make sure that those containers that are going to the vessel are brought in such um, a yard into these container blocks before the vessel arrived. And those containers that are loaded from the vessel temporarily are stacked there and will later be um, con be transported to uh, uh, their real destinations where they are needed. So what we are going to consider today is we consider only this storage yard, or actually we consider only a single container block in this storage yard. You have um, different yard layouts. You have the European layout, and in the European layout, the uh, container blocks are perpendicular um, to the water side, so the short side of the container block is parallel to the water side. In the Asian layout, the long side is uh, parallel to the water side. There are advantages and disadvantages for both. And the two um, black bars that you can hear can you that you can see here um, are stacking grains. Here you see an example. Sorry for the quality. I took it with my smartphone some time ago in Hamburg, and I even don't know exactly where it was. But this is an example of um, uh, rail-mounted gantry grain, and you, you can easily see the size of the grains because here are some trucks that pick up or receive, uh, that uh, drop off or receive containers. And um, so you have rail-mounted gantry grains, and we consider here in this presentation only rail-mounted gantry grains, and as I said, uh, crossover grains have um, two different rails, and there are also rubber-tired gantry grains, but we are not going to consider them. Uh, they can freely move around, and they are not fixed to the block where they are working. The rail-mounted gantry grains cannot move around. They need the rail, and they are fixed. Okay. So I mentioned already the twin cranes. The twin cranes, the twin cranes work on the same level. They cannot overtake each other. Then there um, are the crossover or dual grains. This is the situation here. The larger grain can go over the smaller one, smaller one uh, under certain conditions over the larger one. And there are also uh, situations where you have three grains. Sometimes yes, there are situations where you have three grains on the same level, but then you have to share somehow the area. And here in this picture, you have uh, three cranes where there is a where there are two twin cranes and a larger crane. The larger crane can go over the twin cranes. We will consider only the twin cranes here and the, the dual cranes in, in the rest of this presentation. So let's first come to the twin cranes. Let us consider such a container block. So from now on, we consider only a single container block. And a container block is divided in different bays. So a bay is the containers that if you look at this container block, and this is the long side, and this is the short side, a bay are the containers that are standing in one of these columns. And here you have two grains. You have grain number one and grain number two. We numbered the bays from one to R. And we added a base position, base one for grain one, and the base position for grain two, base two. And we also number them as the, um, a kind of base. So base zero is the base position of grain one, and base uh, and bay R plus one is the base position of the of the right grain. So what can happen? As the following can happen that. Um, uh, sorry, first about the bases. The bases are the pos positions where um, the grains pick up containers if containers are brought to the block or where the grains drop off containers. So these are the places, for instance, where the automated guided vehicles deliver the, the containers. This is to the left or perhaps also to the right. 
So what can happen? Uh, the following can happen. Uh, the crane number one starts at its base, picks up a container that takes two time units, then carries the container to bay number three, drops off the container, it takes again two time units, returns to the base, waits a little bit until the next container arrives, picks it up, takes two time units, continues to base um, to bay six, drops off the container there and uh, returns to the base and so on. And at the same time, uh, the grain number two can start at its base, picks up the container, drops this container in base number six, then returns to the base, picks up the next container, it takes two time units, uh, carries this container to base number five and uh, returns to the base and so on and carries the container. So we would like to minimize the make spin for a set of containers. Um, what we call a cycle or a simple cycle is a situation that um, a grain starts picking up a container that takes eight time units. In this case here, it was two time units that takes eight time units, carries this container to the drop off position, um, which takes again eight time units, and then uh, returns to the base. So this um, time span here we call a cycle. And you will immediately see. Um, that um, at the length of the cycle or the duration of a cycle is at, as it is at least 2a plus 2. And what is this 2? We assume that a grain can be moved much, and it is the case in reality, a grain can be moved much faster from one bay to the neighbor bay than a container can be loaded or unloaded. So the time needed to move a grain from one bay to the neighbor bay is about, uh, is about four seconds. And uh, the time for loading or uh, for lifting or dropping a, um, a container in a bay is uh, a multiple of it. We assume it is a multiple of it. It is something around 30 seconds. And therefore we consider this uh, time for moving as a grain from one bay to a neighbor bay is a time unit, and A is a multiple of this time unit, and A is the time needed to lift or drop of a container. Moreover, we have another parameter here, parameter B. Parameter B is a safety distance. It means if, um, if B has a certain value, in this case two, there must be two base between uh, the um, bay where crane number one and between the bay where crane uh, and uh, the bay where crane number two is operating. So two bays, or at least two bays must be in between. You can easily see um, if we have a value of B greater or equal zero, we can also reduce this problem to the situation where B is equal to zero. Here's B equal to two, but we could easily move this bottom line um, uh, two base up and uh, then we can work on the situation B is equal to zero. So these, um, uh, um, these two situations are equivalent. We need not care about a positive B, we can keep it to zero. Okay, what I'm going to present now Sorry, this is a little bit too far. Uh, what I'm going to present now is um, from a paper uh, that, is, that was published in Networks uh, with my co-authors Mikhail Kovalyov and Andrew Wojcikow. And let us again look at the um, container block and we assume here, different to the situation later, we assume here that, only, that there are only inbound uh, requests, that means containers are only brought into this container block and they will be brought from the left and from the right side. And we would like to minimize the mix spin. Then we have five possible uh, policies how the containers will arrive in these container blocks from both sides. We can have two fixed sequence policies, there are two fixed sequences policy where a container processing sequence is given for each grain. And we indicate it like this. We um, try to use the three field classification from scheduling. 
So the first field is always we have that we have two grains, C four grains and two grains. The last field is always uh, max spin minimization, C max, and only the middle field is uh, changing. So we have two fixed sequences, a fixed sequence for both grains. This is the first policy. The second policy would be um, this dedicated grain policy where containers are pre-assigned um, to the grains and we uh, introduce into the middle field dedic. Policy number three is one fixed, one arbitrary sequence policy where container processing sequence is given for one grain and it can be arbitrary for the other grain. So we write in the middle field fix and any. Then we have the uh, flexible policy where any container can be assigned to any grain at any time. Flex in the middle field and what is what remains is global fix. So global fix sequence policy where, con where the container sequence is given and the relative processing order of containers in the sequence must be preserved by both grains and the global fix is in the middle. Okay, we will have a closer look um, on these uh, policies. The fix fix policy is the easiest policy. And Briscon and Angeludis um, considered a situation and they published a paper, if I remember that correctly, in discrete applied mathematics in 2017, uh, so 2016, sorry, um, where they um, solved this problem to optimality where there are two grains, they can they need not be twin grains, they can be dual grains, two grains um, that are transporting containers and then uh, they try to minimize the mix spin. So they are, with their idea, they are inspired by Aker's method of solving uh, job shop scheduling problems with the graphical method, um, problems with two jobs only. And the idea is you design an acyclic digraph as arc weights and using the method of Briscon and Angeludis, this problem can be solved in O of n uh, to the power of four time. We still think that can be improved in our special situation. Uh, maybe it can be improved to n to the power of two, but we are not sure and we don't know how to do it. Maybe somebody has an idea. So the situation um, dedic in the middle is strongly NP hard. Erdogan et al. proved 2014 that the problem is NP hard in the ordinary sense. The uh, uh, problem fix any, this fix any policy is NP hard in the strong sense. Boysen, Briscon, and Emder proved 2015 that the special case of A equal B equals zero is strongly NP hard. And this proof can be adjusted um, to show the NP hardness of this problem as well. And it can be used to show the NP hardness of this problem where they assume this, that A and B is equal to zero, even if A is equal to one and B is equal to zero. So what is uh, left is the uh, flexible policy and the global fixed policy, but we don't know anything about these uh, uh, problems about the complexity. So those are, Another question uh, to the audience, maybe some people have ideas, but let's let's look at the flexible policy. If you look at the flexible policy, you can assign any uh, container to any grain and assume you have an optimal schedule, we call this optimal schedule E for this problem. What is immediately ob obvious is the following. Um, let X1E be the containers that will be assigned in this optimal solution to the left grain and X2E as the containers that are assigned to the right grain. And J is the index for the containers. And let us assume that RJ is the bay in which uh, container J is supposed to be dropped. And I have to um, say that the bay is always known. The bay or the position where the container is supposed to be dropped in the bay is known from the beginning. It will be uh, calculated uh, before. So we know the bay, we know the position. Assume that RJ is the bay or container J. And then it is immediately obvious that the left grain uh, will not carry a container 
further to the right than the right grain to the left. So the most right position where the left grain drops the container is certainly left of the most left position where the right grain drops the container. If, if, this was not, if this was not the case, you could easily swap the assignment of these two containers and exchange them between the trains and you get a solution that is not worse. So if you have that, then you know immediately you can order your containers by increasing bay number. So you can order them by increasing bay number. And if you do that, you have um, if you have n containers, you have somewhere a separation number. Okay, so that you assign the containers from one to k to the left grain and the containers k plus one to n to the right grain. But um, that doesn't say that your uh, solution is now feasible. Um, if rk and rk plus one is not the same, then you have a feasible and an optimal solution in such a situation, and you can obtain the solution in O of n log n time. But if RK is equal to RK plus plus spawn and a couple of other uh, uh, containers are supposed to be dropped in the same bay, you must find a solution. You must, you must find a situation how to avoid conflicts and interference. It may happen that there are, even if a couple of containers are brought to the same bay, that there are solutions that uh, do not lead to a conflict. But assume we have a situation that uh, solutions would lead to a conflict. So what we can do, we can consider a relaxed problem. We ignore the meeting. So con um, cranes can drop containers in the same bay and we don't care about that. So we have a relaxed problem and we can solve this relaxed problem because of this ordering in O of n log n time. And how would you, how would you uh, make a feasible solution out of a solution that is uh, infeasible out on a, of an optimal solution of this problem? So what would you do? Uh, what could happen? It could happen that the two grains arrive at the same bay and both of them want to drop a container there. And if they arrive at the same bay at the same time, one of the grains has to wait. And the waiting time is A plus one at most, at most A plus one. So you let this... Um, uh, grain wait for a plus one time. If uh, one of the grain arrives later while another grain started already working there, then the waiting time is even less. So the maximum waiting time of a grain is um, a plus one. And how often does that happen? At most um, n max half times. n max is a maximum number of containers uh, that are supposed to be dropped in one bay. So what you would add uh, in order to find a feasible solution from an optimal solution to this problem, and let's say the uh, the uh, uh, make span of such a feasible solution where you insert idle times is C max I, you would add at most A plus one times N max half time to the optimal solution of this problem. If you uh, look at this uh, inequality and you divide this inequality uh, by uh, the optimal make span of this problem over there, then you have divide this one uh, by uh, uh, C max flex. So you have a one here and you divide this part by C max flex. And C max flex is certainly larger than, or at least as big as what I said, the length of the minimum cycle to A plus two times N half. And this is equal to A plus one times N, and N is um, greater than N max. So you finally have a three half um, approximation what you get here. Okay. But in certain situations, uh, you can even do better. In certain situations, uh, if um, the maximum number of containers uh, that will be dropped in one bay is at most uh, half of the number of containers that are carried anyway. So if this is um, the case, then you can even do better. Then you know, okay, you have at least 50% of the containers that are not going to the critical bay. They are they are dropped before the grain reaches the critical, the critical bay. So whenever you have um, a conflict 
in such a situation, you would carry another container that is not going to the critical base that will be dropped earlier. You can carry another uh, container to an earlier place, and then you automatically resolve the conflict. So in such a situation, uh, you would be able to solve this problem with the flexible situation in O of n log n time to optimality. And let us see, let us see um, how often it could be the case. Assume we have 30 base. Assume we stack containers up to a, a height of six. And we assume that five of them uh, are next to each other. Then a bay would have um, 30 containers. And it means um, n max would have to be smaller than 30. And it means if we carry more than 60 containers in such a block, we would have an optimal solution. We, could, we would be able to find an optimal solution. OK, then there is the last policy. But I'm not going to introduce the last policy here now because the results transfer to the last policy as well. You have the same approximation, a three-half approximation, and um, it as uh, so solution ideas are very similar. Okay, what I should mention, what I forgot to mention is that um, in such a cycle that I mentioned at the very beginning, a, a crane will never move somewhere with a container and then move back with the same container. So a crane would never uh, cross a grain would never cross the same bay with the same container twice. That would not have happen. And the container is involved in a conflict at most once. And you can easily think about that. So this moving back will not happen because then you would always prefer to wait. But let's go uh, to the second part of the presentation, which is more applicable to the, uh, than the first part. In the second part, we look at um, Crossover grains, and this is what I'm uh, presenting to you now, is based on a paper with Jenny Norsak de Priscon and myself and uh, published in Transportation Science. Uh, sorry. Uh, so we look at um, the situation where the larger grain can go over the smaller grain, even if the larger grain carries a container. The smaller grain can go under the larger grain, only a larger grain is not working in a bay. So this is a crossover grain scheduling problem. We consider the European layout. We have um, transportation requests from the water and from the land side area. So we know the origin and the destination for the containers. We have inbound requests. So the inbound requests means that uh, containers come from the water side or from the land side area. Container, containers enter. Um, the uh, block, the container block from both head ends um, and are supposed to be uh, carried to its determined position. And um, you can read in the paper by Dorndorf and Schneider, for instance, that um, the position where the containers are dropped is calculated beforehand. We have outbound requests where containers somewhere in the uh, storage yard, in the block, are picked and brought either to the land side area, to the head end uh, leading to the land side area, or to the head, head end uh, leading to the water side area. And you have housekeeping request, uh, requests that um, are reshuffling and rearranging the uh, containers when there is um, no need to serve the vessel, when the vessels are gone, and um, so to make um, the access to the containers a bit easier. So as I said, we consider dual grains here. And the two grains run on different tracks, so I can jump over that. And then we can formulate our crossover grain scheduling problem. The crossover grain scheduling problem is um, it evaluates in which order it means the grain routing and in which and by which grain it means the container dispatching. So transportation requests are carried out such that grain interferences, it means we want to have a conflict grain scheduling are prevented and um, we minimize the mix spin. 
And um, not surprisingly, the crossover a grain scheduling problem is strongly NP hard, and we proved it by a reduction to three partition. And let me introduce a solution approach to you. So we um, designed a branch and cut approach with a logic-based bender stick composition. The uh, dispatching and routing problem isn't the master problem. So the dispatch and the routing problem evaluates in which order and by which crane the requests are conducted and there is a sub-problem. The sub-problem is uh, to um, achieve the conflict-free scheduling problem so that the grains do not interfere. Let me give you an example here. Um, we have a storage area of eight bays. Um, we have an outer grain that starts in bay one, and we have an inner grain that starts uh, from bay eight. We have three requests. We have the uh, origin bay here for the three requests. It's bay three, three, or four. In brackets, you find the service times. Now we assume that the service times uh, can be even different. Um, then we have the destination bay here. So we, the three requests are all housekeeping requests. We have the destination bay in this uh, special example. The service times are again in brackets. And now we have the uh, two uh, grains. And let's assume that um, we assign the first and the third request to the outer grain. And the ordering in which uh, the uh, two requests are processed is first the first request and second the third request. And the uh, second request is uh, assigned to the inner grain. So um, then we get the following solution. Here the x axis is the time axis and the y axis is the bay axis. And um, the outer grain starts at time zero in bay number one and uh, is supposed to go to bay number three. So it goes there, picks up a container which takes one time unit. And this container is supposed to go to bay number five and dropping it off takes one time unit. So the, the grain goes from bay three to bay five, drops off the container, it takes um, one time unit. And then from um, this bay, the uh, grain continues to bay number four to bay, to pick up the next container, which takes two time units. So from bay five to bay four, the container will move there, pick up a container over uh, two time units, and this container is supposed to be dropped in, in bay three. So it continues to bay three, and dropping it off, it takes two time units. So the time when, when the outer grain is ready is uh, 12. Uh, the smaller grain, the inner grain, starts in bay eight. Uh, it's, it is supposed to go to bay three, picks up a container, it takes two time unit, and the container has to be carried to bay five, and dropping it off takes another two time units. So um, the smaller grain is ready at time 10, and the mix band would be 12 here. So you see two positions here. Um, where the uh, grains cross. And the question is, is there any grain interference? So if you look at the two positions, what happens here? So the outer grain uh, picked the container here in base three and carries this container to bay five. And we said at the beginning, the outer grain can pass the inner grain, even if the outer grain is carrying a container. There might be situations where this is not possible, then you have to change some as a model a little bit. Um, so this is not a big issue. So the outer grain can move there. The inner grain is not carrying anything and goes to the base three. So there is no conflict here and the outer grain can easily go over the inner grain and there is no conflict in this situation. The question is what is here? In this situation, it is uh, totally different. Here, the outer grain arrived at, at time uh, seven to bay four and started uh, working in bay four, uh, dropping off the container, which takes two time units. 
At the same time, the inner grain would like to cross this bay four because the inner grain is carrying a container from bay three to bay five. So this is not possible. The inner grain cannot go under the outer grain as long as the outer grain is working in a bay. And how to solve it? A possibility is that, that you solve it um, with including waiting time. So you let the inner grain wait for two time units, and this is a solution here. You let the inner grain wait for two time units. And then the outer grain is uh, done. Uh, was working in, in uh, bay number four and con can continue to bay number three and the inner grain can also cross here and there is no problem anymore. So this is the solution. The question is where to include the time units. So we have the master problem. And um, what we saw first, this part here is uh, obtained by uh, solving the master problem. And then um, you might have an infeasible solution because uh, it is possible that you have conflicts, as we just saw. And uh, in order to resolve these conflicts, we have the subproblem, and um, we solve the subproblem, and perhaps have to include um, logic based benders constraints um, in our model. So let's come to the model now. The model is already here, but this is not readable for you now. We will come to the model now. So we have two grains. We have a number of bays. Uh, we have uh, n transportation requests. For each um, request, we have an origin location, a destination location. We have an initial location of uh, each grain, SK. Uh, we have a service time at the origin. Uh, locations or a time to pick up the container. We have a time at the destination location, the time for dropping off the container. Um, we have travel times. This TIJ is the travel time um, of uh, the uh, grain when it's not carrying a container. It means after dropping off the container and finishing request I, and before starting request J, this is a travel time between the end of one request and the, the uh, start starting time of uh, uh, the start of the next request. And we have loaded travel times, TII. These are the travel times from the origin of um, request I to the destination of request I. Um, so these are the times when uh, the crane is carrying a container. And our decision variables are y, i, j, k. y, i, j, k is equal to 1. If request j is conducted after request i by grain k, otherwise it is 0. And we have um, w as a mix bin. Then we have the model here. And this is a massa model that was uh, not readable on the previous slide. Um, we minimize the make spin. We pretend that the uh, origin location of um, of the grains is uh, like can be treated like like a request. So each grain has to start at its origin location. Then each this set of constraints uh, assures that each request is uh, treated and served. So we have uh, flow conservation constraints with this set of uh, constraints. Then we have sub to elimination constraints here. So we have to uh, make sure that um, there is one tour for each crane. And finally, this is the definition of the mix span. So if uh, request I is um, uh, performed before request J, then the contribution to the mix bin is the following. Uh, the service time at the origin of uh, request I, then the loaded traveling time to the destination, the service time at the destination, the time for dropping off the container. And then uh, from here, you have the traveling time, the, the empty traveling time to uh, the origin of the next request J and the domains of the variables. So this is a master problem. And you need the subproblem in order to um, reach a conflict-free grain scheduling problem. So a grain interference can happen. And 
And um, so we have to solve a subproblem. And um, from the subproblem, we obtain a conflict free grain schedule with a minimum max span. And let's assume this max span is, uh, is W hat. And in order to solve the subproblem, we have the same situation as I uh, introduced uh, to the first policy before um, for the twin grains. We can again use the um, method, the algorithm by Briscon and Angeludis, which is inspired by the ACAS graphical method for job shops, uh, two jobs. So we can um, solve the subproblem using their method. So we have a set of uh, containers and the orders in which, um, and the sequences in which um, orders they should be processed by each grain. And we consider this as a kind of a, a, a job shop scheduling problem and we can solve that. And we get um, an optimal solution, this uh, W hat um, mix bin. And then um, you can ignore this H here. This H here is only an iteration index. And then if, um, your subproblem delivers a max band that is equal to the max band that you obtained in the master problem, then you are optimal and can stop. If this is not the case, if your max band is larger, then you introduce um, uh, these um, uh, logic based benders constraints. Um, what you have here is you have all the variables that are equal to one and belong to the two of the two of the uh, two grains. And um, so if your solution of the subproblem, so if the max span of the subproblem is larger than the max span of your master problem, you must um, force at least one of the y variables that is at the moment equal to one from the master problem, you must force it uh, to zero, at least one of them, uh, by including this logic based benders constraints uh, into your master problem. So we did that, and let me introduce the computational study. Um, we use the, the following computer, this is specified here. At that time, we used the CPLEX 12.5. We, we used the data generator by Priscon, Yen, and Wiel, uh, published uh, in 2019. And this data generator allows you to set a, a number of parameters and to generate data that, that is um, similar to real data. And we considered um, different um, scenarios. We considered 15 requests and 20 requests. We wanted to solve them to optimality. And then we considered also a larger number of requests. Uh, let me introduce first uh, the results for the 15 and 20 requests. So here you have the outbound, here you have three numbers. You have the number of outbound, inbound, and housekeeping requests. The numbers are randomly generated. Then you have here the lower bounds. The so lower bounds are, uh, is the lower bound at the root node of our master problem, where we do not include a single, um, up to elimination constraint and uh, not a single um, 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 uh, benders constraint. So it's um, without these constraints, it is the uh, optimal solution of um, uh, the master problem in the root node. Um, this is the objective values that, that we obtained. So these are the optimal values for this data here. The street PO times are listed here. And the number of sub to elimination constraints and that we added and the uh, number of logic-based um, vendors constraints. In the last row, you see the average values. What you can immediately observe is that the lower bounds are very close to the optimal values. And as you can see, the so times are pretty low. So we could, on average, we could solve them um, significantly below one, mi one minute. If we um, consider 20 requests, it's getting larger, it's getting uh, more difficult. And um, the time limit was one hour, 3,600 seconds. As you can see, a couple of times we were unable to find um, an optimal solution or to prove the optimality. Um, and what you can see in brackets here is the um, 
the gap in percent. So the gap in percent uh, was always far below 1% of the optimal solution. And the number of um, sub to elimination constraints and logic based benders constraints increased significantly, which is not a surprise. So we wanted to see what happens if we look at um, at um, larger instances. So we looked at uh, request, 30 requests and 40 requests. And uh, we wanted to see what would happen because um, the um, um, computational results before were very good. What would happen if we stopped after 10 seconds? So we stopped after 10 seconds. And what is listed here after 10 seconds is the optimality get, gap. As you see, we are roughly about 1% um, from the optimum. And again, here you have the obtained objective value and the lower bounds as it was before. And this is for, for 30 requests and for 40 requests, you are a little bit larger than 1% uh, from the optimum. But again, the lower bounds, the average lower bound is very close to the obtained solutions. That the gap is a little bit higher here is not a surprise because we are not necessarily optimal. And it's the same here. And then we were wondering what would happen if um, we added a little bit uh, uh, time and we said, okay, what happens in a minute? So in a minute, the following happens. All values in red are improvements to the values that you saw on the previous slide with 10 seconds. So these red values are improvements. Um, the dark values, the black values are the same. And here, of course, the um, difference between lower bound and objective value is closer because uh, we have better values now. And um, the gap is on average here half a percent. And here it is a little bit more than half a percent. So we were quite satisfied. It seems that uh, this uh, optimal procedure, this branch and cut approach, can be also used as a heuristic if you stop the time um, after a couple of seconds or after a minute. We also uh, tried to compare it to um, another approach. Of course, this approach is older from 2010 by Fiss and Rothbergen. They use similar annealing and they assigned randomly the requests to the different cranes and solved them. They didn't care uh, about the conflicts so what we did we had to change that a little bit because we had to care about the conflicts and we used two simulated annealing approaches the first simulated annealing approach was um, that um, when simulated annealing stopped we um, made sure that the obtained solution is feasible using the uh, procedure by Priscon and Angeludis this was simulated annealing one. And number two is uh, when each time when we um, generated a solution, we made sure that the solution is um, feasible using the same method. And uh, we, saw, we used the um, instances with 20 requests and 30 requests. And what you can see here is simulated annealing obtained only four times better results then our approach in all other cases, our approach was at least as good as simulated annealing. Okay, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. Okay, thank you very much for your talk. I have uh, allowed everybody to unmute. So if you have a question, don't, don't uh, hesitate. For example, Florian, go ahead. Huh? You have to unmute your mic. I don't hear you. Maybe you have a problem with loudspeaker. You are not muted, but I don't hear you. I so, don't so, hear me. So, so let me ask you the first question, and then we can, maybe Florian will resolve his problem. So, uh, so your. Uh, your criterion is Cmax, but yes. in reality, 
the problem is not so static. Probably it's kind of online. The, the containers are coming and leaving. Isn't there any other criterion that would be more like closer to real problem? For example, weighted tardiness where maybe different uh, different um, activities should happen to different okay this is a world. good question this is a good question and um this question is not not at all a surprise um cmax has a couple of advantages and we are from scheduling we know that cmax is a very nice criterion this is the um uh, uh, one argument for CMAX, and of course you can use it, what we, we did, you can use it in a rolling horizon approach. So you shift each time your planning horizon by a little bit, and then you use CMAX. Um, but you could easily also imagine that you have uh, other criteria that might be more important, or maybe even interesting, maybe not more important, but even interesting for the people from the harbor. Um, our experience in the harbor is, and um, meanwhile, I was in Hamburg, I don't know, six, seven times, eight times or even more. Our experience in the harbor is um, that they are interested in having nearly everything what is uh, doable. And they are interested in what would be the result if we, if we changed it, if we did it differently, if we used another objective, or if we used another procedure. And if you are asking them, are you going to implement that? Is that interesting for you? Or is there any other harbor uh, where it is implemented? Then you get the answer. Most likely you get the answer that um, it is not uh, implemented at the moment and we would not immediately do it and we, are, we don't know a harbor that is doing it or maybe we know a harbor that is doing it but we don't know it we don't do it but we would like to know if it could be attractive we would like to know what can be achieved at most so they are interested interested in the results but it doesn't mean that they immediately implement them but I could imagine that other objectives are popular, but of course, CMAX is the, the easiest one and the okay, okay. most convenient one. I understand. And so many things work in the CMAX that don't work so easily if you don't, if you don't consider CMAX. For instance, constraint programming is much better with CMAX than with any other objective. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, so let me ask Absin for his question. I've seen. Go ahead. Uh, you are not muted. Hmm. I don't hear anything. Oh, me too. Me neither. And Florian, if you try to ask. Okay. I can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we, we can, can hear you. you. Okay. <laughs> Finally. Uh, well, actually, thank you for the nice uh, talk. And, and regarding the last question with the different objectives, uh, I remember talking about um, energy objectives, and I think you had the plan to integrate them. Is, is there any news on this? Or, or do you think that this becomes more important for harbors? Um, could you just elaborate on that a little bit? Difficult to answer. I think um, it becomes more important um, because it becomes important that um, in different areas, if you have the automated guided vehicles and you uh, um, use electric cars, there's this electric automatic guided vehicles, they are all electric in Hamburg, they go automatically to the recharging station. Um, I could imagine that it is important to save energy in this area. I could also imagine that it is important to save energy when you are stacking these containers. If you, if you pull a container deep down somewhere and you have to pull it over the other containers, it takes more energy as if you stack them differently. But I don't know how urgencies objectives are at the moment. Maybe they have other objectives at the moment that are more relevant for them, but if um, there's enough time for them and they have some additional flexibility, I could imagine that energy objectives become more relevant. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other question? If not, uh, let me also ask, uh, in, in your setting, you consider to have a continuous time, right? Uh, big, uh, the, the, the figures were with discrete time, but but in your formulation, yes. you consider continuous time. Right? Yes, but actually we work with discrete time. With discrete time. But mm -hmm. can you leverage on using you know, some kind of time indexed formulation or can it be advantage or 
it's clear that it wouldn't. Huh? We haven't tried. Um, we don't know if it, if it would work better. It it worked extremely good here in this situation. And as you could see, this uh, bounce were extremely good. Mm -hmm. um, we haven't tried with another formulation. So it's difficult no. to defeat it. I, I cannot say that it would be uh, at least as good or even better. I have no idea. OK. And also, you have mentioned subtour elimination. Yes. So in the formulation, so is there like TSP problem hidden somewhere that, that you need to go over? Uh, over several destinations uh, by the crane, or yes, it is a little bit different. Yes, it is, elimination. A, it is a, a, a kind of small TSP. You have to make sure that your that your um, crane tour is really a tour, um, or at least a pass. Um, if you not, if you do not go back to the position where you started. Uh, you go to the pickup place. Um, of course, you have some orders in between. You go to the pickup place of a container, then you go to the drop off place, then you go to the next pickup, next drop off place, and the sequence of the of the requests is the important thing. So it's not a not identical to a TSP, but it has of course some similarities. Okay. Okay. Do we have any other question? If not, so let me thanks to Erwin for his informative talk. And I would like to remind you that in two weeks, we will have a talk by Vikram uh, Tiwari, and he will speak about surgery scheduling, uh, research and practice. Uh, so we will have uh, one talk from the US, uh, Vanderbilt University. Uh, and um, I'm looking forward to, to, to see you in, uh, in two weeks. Uh, thank you for, for, for being with us and uh, Keep smiling. Bye bye. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you very much. And thank you for listening. And so it's a pity that Mike couldn't join because he is sitting in the in the in the aircraft now. It's a but small he can, he can watch it offline. It's not That's a true. Big yes. deal. Oh, thank okay. you very much. Thank you. Thank bye. you again for a nice talk. Bye bye. Bye bye, guys. And girls. Bye. bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Erwin, I wanted to ask you one question if you are still here. No. He already disappeared. No worries. Okay. Bye bye, everybody.